So I'm Andy Bayo of Waxy.org. I'm here at Music Fest Northwest, looking on downtown Portland, and I just saw Girl Talk perform in front of thousands of adoring fans, sweat flying as far as the eye could see. I and I think I lost count of the number of samples that I heard, probably in the first two or three minutes. Um, for the last 10 years, Girl Talk has helped redefine remix culture. I'm thrilled to have Greg Gillis here with us. Greg, welcome to Portland. Thank you, that was quite, quite an intro. Thank you. How was, the, how was that from the stage? It looked insane. It was good. I mean, we've been doing a bunch of kind of summer outdoor shows. Um, seems like every city has their own festival. A lot of them have more than one now. And um, a lot of times it's like, can be really like intense on the temperature level, you know, just humid, hot summers things. So it was like nice and cool. And uh, for me, it's like, it is like an athletic event up there. So when it's cooler, it's, it's easier. You're it's like, you're like running a marathon. Yeah, so I felt really good tonight. Like I, we've kind of, this is the end of like a touring run and I was kind of exhausted and uh, the temperature was nice. And uh, yeah, turnout was great, it sold it out. Someone told me they haven't done that before at that venue. So I was excited about that. And uh, yeah, it's like every time I come back, it's, you know, you, you set the precedent once before with the show. So you always kind of want to take it to the next level. And I thought it was cool, you know, I love, you know, kind of the opportunity to play in the city square makes it more of an event to begin with. Right. So I think the show being there and all of that versus if it was just even at a venue here, it just, it's the advantage is going in. It's already like an event, something going on Saturday night outside, end of summer. So yeah, I, I really liked it. Definitely like a memorable show. And, and you have been touring pretty relentlessly since Feed the Animals came out. I read somewhere something like 300 or more uh, uh, shows. That's insane. Um, but you are you're taking a well-deserved break from touring and working on a on a new project. You want to talk about that a little? Yeah, I mean, it's not necessarily. It's like multiple things. I, I uh, I've been touring pretty steady since about 2006, 2007, and. Um, I mean, I've done shows as Girl Talk since 2000, but prior to that, it was just like a few shows a year, no big deal. And uh, it really turned into kind of full time around 2007. So um, it's been cool, it's just been, you know, at least minimally like 150 to 200 shows a year each of those years. And uh, I make all of my music kind of thinking about the live show and like what's gonna work in that setting. And I like that and I get feedback from the audience and, that, and then that will go on to kind of influence the next release. And it's kind of been a cycle of that for the past three albums. Um, so yeah, I kind of made a call where I don't think the show is like as big as it ever could be, but I'm really satisfied with what it's been for the past year. I definitely think it's like the tightest and most orchestrated. It's, it's more of a spectacle than it's ever been. So I just feel very comfortable with what it is. And I was kind of thinking about the future into next year. And I just have been sitting on a lot of ideas musically that I wanted to get to that maybe don't fit into the box of like what would translate well in the show. Um, and even a lot of times I put stuff on a record that I may have tried out live and it kind of fell flat. And it w will eventually work live once people hear it at, on the record and they get familiar with it, then it works well. So yeah, I've just had all these different ideas of things to do and I just thought the timing was right and I kind of have played just about every city I've wanted to play across the world and feel like I've been doing it pretty thoroughly. It's not like I have, you know, it's just like almost, not, it's not anywhere near overkill but I just feel like it's been thorough. You know, I've just done the cities I want to do and uh, yeah, I just haven't really taken like more than a couple weeks off in like five or six years. Like I haven't taken a vacation ever um, and uh, so I just thought it'd be cool to just take the time off and explore music and ideas that don't necessarily have to work in a live setting. I'm guessing one of those things you would be really hard to pull off live would be anything more down tempo. Yeah, you know, I, I kind of go through the whole, like, basically every tempo you can play. You know, there's only like so many ultimately. Um, I guess you can like double and triple everything. So there's elements of really down tempo stuff, but really brief, you know what I mean? And, and I think it's kind of like breathing room. and. Um, you know, and it's even just like, even with the last record, you know, sometimes it is that sample might be just a little obscure or something like, I'm trying to think tonight, or something like, um, you know, on the last record I sampled the band Supergrass and their song All Right, and uh, I've tried that out live prior to that record, and I think that sample, it's a famous song, popular song many people know, but I think it kind of fell a little flat with the audience, and uh, now it's like post the record and it's on the record, you know, playing it live, people are like, oh yeah, I, I know that point from the record. Yeah, so, so it's kind of like, um, you know, even the down-tempo stuff, up-tempo, obscure, whatever, I think a lot of times it's just kind of introducing the song, making it more familiar. So I think when you 
are making new material that has to work in the live context and you want it to be at the same level as the stuff that they already know, that means that it has to be somewhat familiar to begin with or it has to be even more intense or more over the top than the stuff they already know. So that's a challenge and it's something I've been into but I do feel like, you know, it hasn't reached its peak but I feel like I've done it so thoroughly for like five or six years I'd like to just step away just to like clear my mind and, you know, exercise something else. Your work has inspired a lot of people, not just other remix artists who can maybe feel a bit more confident enough that, uh, you know, they can push the boundaries of sampling, but, but new creations like Girl Walk, you know, which is an epic 72 minute music video uh, with, a, with a girl dancing throughout, you know, basically set to, uh, set to the entirety of your last album and then released as a film. Right. Uh, what does that feel like to see people remixing you after spending a decade remixing others? I really love that film, especially because it's definitely not what I would do to like for a music video for that record. Like I like that that was like their interpretation and they didn't come to me and were like, we're gonna do this, are you cool with it? You know what I mean? They, they definitely told me about it. Um, I just liked that it was 100% their vision, like I had no input and it was their interpretation of that record and, and a visual and it was, you know, an exact parallel to basically what I do, you know, taking this music that inspires me and trying to make something new out of it. That's what they were doing and, and the fact that they did it and executed it so well enough that they were able to like tour with it and air it in various theaters and it was getting a lot of press and it was even like, I mean, there's so many parallels. It's like, I feel like so many people are turned on to music through the sampling I do who may not have heard these samples previously. A lot of people first heard about Girl Talk through that movie. It was just like, it just wasn't in their like world, but they do pay attention to like maybe a more underground cinema or, or that sort of thing. So people were finding out about it through it. So it was like, it was perfect. You know, I, I loved that it was, you know, inspiring someone to do something that they wanted I don't know if they thought about it in those terms, you know, that, you know, I, I have no idea. I honestly haven't spoken to them to enough to know, like, whether it was, you know, they were trying to make something transformative or make something new, but it's what they did. And, uh, you know, the fact that they had success with it, I, I loved it. I thought it was cool. And, you know, you've said repeatedly your albums uh, are protected under fair use, should be under the fair use doctrine of U.S. copyright law, and obviously you have an amazing case for that. It seems like the general cons consensus out there is that, you know, the publishers, the labels are afraid uh, that you would win in court and set that precedent, kind of opening the floodgates for that, you know, for remix culture and that and that uh, enabling that kind of sampling. I just wondered what you what you think about the current state of of that copyright law and the chilling effect of you know how it's affecting uh, art. Yeah, I mean, as long as I've been doing this, there hasn't been much change. You know, if anything, it's tightened up a little bit. I, I remember at some point in time there may have been like a length of a sample that was legal, and then that was like that's over with now. Um, so it's never been like, oh, it's it's just the, everything's changed and the laws have shifted over here. But I definitely think the uh, basically the world who is attached to the internet's like mentality has shifted. You know, everyone has just seen every day you go on YouTube, every day you just see a remix and, you know, an answer, some sort of remix of a remix of a remix, you know, everything from auto-tune the news to, you know, 12 year olds remixing Lady Gaga to, you know, animated GIFs even or a form of it, you know, just everything is just, it's out there. So. I think young kids growing up right now, new generation, it's just everyone has just been exposed to it as an art form. It's like you don't really have to like talk people into like, I swear, you can take something that has existed and make something new out of it. People just see it on a daily basis. And even in music, you know, it's rare to go to a music festival and see a band that doesn't have some sort of electronic piece of equipment triggering some sort of sample, a laptop on the side of the stage triggering drum loops or whatever. It's kind of like seems vintage to see a band without that. You know, it's, it's like almost like a, it's almost uh, a very specific effort to avoid that, you know, a more throwback sort of thing. So, yeah, it's just widespread, you know, and I, I just think, you know, just even talking the interviews now versus five years ago, it's just so much different, you know, everyone sees it, everyone knows it. Um, I think when I first came out, kind of with Night Ripper in 2006, granted it was new, but it was really like people, you know, the whole talk was like, oh, you're going to be sued, and what's it feel like? Like, those are the questions, and like, it just shifted. I mean, granted, that hasn't happened, so people can't say that, but simultaneously, I just think the exposure to the whole kind of remix culture and just everything out there is just, just it's just a whole new world. So, um, you know, it's fascinating. I don't know if the laws necessarily have to change, 
you know, I, I still believe in the idea of fair use. Fair use is fair use. And like the, the internet world and everything that exists, remixing could all exist under fair use. I think a lot of times people who kind of look at it on a surface level think of it as like, oh, he wants like chaos and anarchy and all copyright laws abolished. And it's, it's not like that at all. And if anything, like I'm a big supporter of, you know, traditional copyright. Like I still, not for moral reasons, I just really love buying CDs in the stores. I've never gotten so much into downloading music. Like I download music, you know, mixtapes and stuff that's specific for the internet. And I don't think there's anything morally wrong with downloading music or anything like that. But I've just, I do like buying records and I like going through that whole process. And I don't think that someone should be able to just, you know, copy that CD and be able to sell it on the the street for money or anything I like that. I think that's a huge misconception is people think that uh, supporters of remix culture think that you know artists shouldn't get paid. Right. Yeah, I see it all the time. There's all these things kind of come up where I just think people would expect me to think this way, but it's not really like that, you know? It's like, I don't even think of this as like that radical, like I'm not like trying to break down these walls. This is an anarchy. It's kind of like, I think as the years go on, it's going to turn into more just basic logic. I think we're fading towards that. Like, you know, like, oh, of course, like, and I, I don't know, the albums when I make them, I never thought about it in terms of that, that it just turned out to be a really good example that if you use 300 samples, like how do you release this by the traditional samples if you wanted to license them? How can you do it? Yeah, and that wasn't a game plan. I just kind of did all the samples because that was interesting musically to me, straight up. You know, it was never like this will be like the loophole and then like no one will challenge it. That was never the mentality. But then it like just raises an interesting point, you know what I mean? And I, honestly, when I started, I always just thought it would kind of exist in the underground. And when you do it at an underground level for so long, you don't expect it to kind of go off to this next level. So, you know, once it did, then it was like, oh, I guess this is like, I always believed in fair use regardless of how many samples I was using. But then all of a sudden it was like, oh, I guess this is like something you have to focus on. And where does this fit into the legal system? And I guess this, what I'm doing technically doesn't really make sense anywhere. You know, you can't do it that traditional way. You can't do it this way. So yeah, I don't know. It's just one of many examples. You know, it's like, there's so many things. I, I honestly think it's a tiny footnote in terms of this grand thing. And to me, the bigger statement is just this internet culture, just every day. It's just you go on any like message board, you go on any, anything. It's just, everything is a response. You know what I mean? Even just I'm on an email group with my friends. Everyone's like, you know, it's always just a response to this, a response to that, making this, making that, responding to the media, making something out of that media. Right, there's a great video series uh, by Kirby Ferguson, Everything's a Remix which you know, basically talks about how all invention you know, comes from somewhere. There's this, there's this false myth of, uh, of the, the inventor and the idea, and it just comes from within. But right. everything, uh, everything comes from somewhere. Even, even Apple you know, came from Xerox. Right. It's like you think of Steve Jobs as the ultimate innovator, and he was borrowing as well. Right, and it's like, you know, everywhere. It's just even in music, you know, in classical music, to borrow like motifs is very common. You know, here's like this theme. Or, you know, of course, it's it's just common knowledge. I feel like with like you know music fans, it's like you know the Rolling Stones bar all these blues riffs, and you know it's just it's just it is what it is. You know what I mean?